Hi, everybody. How are you doing today? So I'm so excited to be here. I love any kind of a conference that encourages women to speak our minds, to use our brains, to become leaders. I think that's one of the most important things that we all need to do right now. So hooray for that. What an amazing conference. I've been asked to speak about my book, Think. The full title of my book is Think, Straight Talk for Women to Stay Smart in a Dumbed Down World. And I began the odyssey that turned into this book, that turned into hundreds of speaking events that I've done all over the country about this topic with this one little statistic, and I'm going to step out because I'm not a big podium person. Um, and that is 25% of young American women would rather win America's next top model than the Nobel Peace Prize. 20, thank you. And 23% would rather lose their ability to read than their figure. Presumably for life, right? So presumably they would choose lifetime illiteracy over putting on a few pounds. So I saw this statistic. It was a study done by Oxygen Media a couple of years ago. And then, you know, the news, uh, the news went on to the next story, or should I say the news went on to the next story, which was probably about Justin Bieber or Miley Cyrus or Snooki. And, but I really couldn't go on. I really couldn't go on because it seemed to me that that statistic comported with thoughts that I'd been having for a long time, and that is, what the heck is going on with us? What is going on with young women, with older women, with girls in America? So I had to do my own investigation. I had to find out what was going on here, and is it just my overheated imagination? Is it just this one study, or do we really have a problem? And so I did about two years' worth of research on this topic, and uh, I, I knew, as I said, from my own life, that there was an issue here. So I'm a legal analyst for NBC News, for CNN, for MSNBC. I've appeared just about daily on American television for the last 12 years or so. I run my own law practice and I write books, as you know. And I went, I'm also a big traveler. So I went to Cambodia a few years ago and there was an international war crimes tribunal going on there. Anybody have heard of that international war crimes tribunal? So I hadn't heard of it, but I heard just before the trip I did, and I'm very much interested in war crimes tribunals that address issues of genocide and atrocities that go on all over the world, and maybe one day can stop them or at least bring justice to the victims. So I don't speak Khmer, which is the language in, in Cambodia, but I learned how to say hello and thank you. That was about it. And basically by saying hello, thank you, hello, thank you, smiling and not leaving, I got myself in to the International War Crimes Tribunal. And when I got in, I discovered that there was a fair amount of media there, but almost no American media. And when I spoke to the public information officer, she said, yeah, you know, we really don't get any American media here. And I thought, well, that's interesting. I mean, it's a fascinating tribunal. I could do a whole different talk about it, but it's bringing to justice the perpetrators who were responsible for the killing of about two million people in the 1970s. So I came home and I had shot video and I had uh, contact information for people who would be loved to do interviews. And I went to all of the networks that I worked for and I said, I want to do this story about the American war crimes tribunal in Cambodia. And everybody said to me, well, uh, you know, that's interesting, Lisa, but I don't think we can do it this week. We're pretty busy. Maybe we could do it next week. Maybe we can do it the following week. Pitch us again next week. And so I kept pitching it and pitching it, and I kept getting the door slammed in my face. Uh, I was going on television. I was talking about topics, and they were generally celebrity topics, celebrity divorces, sex triangles, you know, that kind of thing. So... Finally, uh, at one point, a man named Dith Pran passed away. He was the man who uh, was the subject of a movie called The Killing Fields. He was a Cambodian man who survived uh, the genocide and went on to become a New York Times award-winning photographer. So he passed away. In the news business, we call that a news hook. So I said, let's talk about his life, and let's also talk about the war crimes tribunal. Well, I still couldn't get it on any of the, any of the major networks. And finally, one day, one of the networks said to me, Lisa, we want you on tomorrow to talk about three legal stories. You can choose any three. And I said, okay, guess what? I want to talk about the war crimes tribunal. <laughs> and um, I couldn't even get it on as one of three. And all three were celebrity stories. And that was when I had my aha moment. 
that we have a problem in America. We certainly have a problem in the media. I've noticed in about the 12 or 15 years that I've been working in the media, this huge rise in celebrity stories. To, and what's getting crowded out? What are we not talking about because there's no time to talk about it? Serious international issues, issues pertaining to women, issues pertaining to what's going on in the world, not only at home, but abroad. And so it's really not surprising that Americans are highly ignorant about these topics and care more about you know, what's going on with some celebrities' divorce than what's going on in the world. And so I was particularly interested in this topic as it pertains to women and as it pertains to women and girls. And I wanted to know, you know, are we getting dumbed down or what is the status? So there's some good news and there's some bad news here. So let's start with the good news. We're killing it in school. I mean, we are killing it. We, I mean females, are killing it in school. I don't know if you guys are aware of how fantastic we are doing in school, but girls are outperforming boys, graduating in greater numbers and with greater grades, better grades, high school, college, graduate school, law school, med school. I mean, we're freaking smart. All right? <laughs> and basically, in every country where obstacles to girls' education have been removed, this is the case. In the US, in all 50 states, girls and boys are tested in reading at three levels, third grade, eighth grade, and 11th grade. Out of the 50 states, and how many do you think girls are outperforming boys in reading at all three levels? All 50. Go us, right? In 40 first world countries, girls and boys are tested in reading. 40 developed countries. And how many of the 40 are girls outperforming boys in reading? I can't hear you. Four, <laughs> right, right. And I love the confidence. Everybody, yeah, 40, of course. Of course we do, right? We're so smart. And it's not just in reading, which people somehow think traditionally is a more female thing. Uh, they think that now. They didn't used to think that, but now we do. Uh, the Google Science Fair, uh, when at the time I was writing my book a couple years ago, this is a very highly competitive uh, science fair that goes on all across the country, and they pick three winners, the top three winners, all girls. Go girls. In math and science, in fact, girls and boys are now neck and neck. If you look at the top 10% of just about any graduating class, it's crowded with females. If you look at the bottom 10%, it's crowded with males. And this has become such an accepted, normal part of our world now that I was giving a college commencement speech last summer, and the night before, I got laryngitis, probably because I talked too much. So this happens once in a while. I got laryngitis, and I was very concerned, and I was talking to my daughter, and I said, what am I going to do? I have, I have no voice. And she said, I don't know, Mom, what are you going to do? And I said, well, if I really can't talk tomorrow, I'll just go to the valedictorian, I guess, and have her read the speech. And she said, how do you know the valedictorian is female? And I said, oh, you're right. You know, I just assumed that she was. And she was. <laughs> Although I will say there are some exceptions. At my son's recent college graduation, there was a male valedictorian. He was a women's studies major and gave <laughs> a very feminist speech. So go him. But that, so that does happen. There are still some exceptions to the rule. So we're killing it in school. Uh, you know, you show me a top performer, I'm probably going to be showing you a girl. And yet, and yet, when I speak at colleges, as I do all the time, uh, generally uh, what I'm told by a lot of young women is that being hot is so important to them. And some of them tell me privately that they would rather be hot than smart. And there are a lot of studies that bear that out. And it's not just limited to the young. I know a middle-aged female judge who told me that she would give up the bench, give up the bench, if she could just be thin. There's a new obsession with our appearance that's emerged in the last generation. American women are 5% of the world's population, but we are 40% of the purchasers of makeup and plastic surgery. In fact, the majority of plastic surgery that's purchased worldwide is purchased by American women. 20% of girls under the age of 18 regularly wear foundation, eyeliner, and lipstick. These are girls, little girls, little girls. And half of girls ages three to six worry about getting fat. So the beauty industry is really polluting our minds, creating this level of obsession with what we look like the amount of time, especially, that we spend on beauty has skyrocketed in the last generation. And at the same time, I had to ask myself, okay, so what are we giving up? 
what are we losing in the process as we're spending all of this time on all of these uh, less important things? Well, here's some of the disturbing statistics about Americans. And I want to emphasize, of course, the problem in ignorance is not just a female problem. It's, a, it's an American problem, male and female. So there are entire TV shows in other countries, did you know this, uh, devoted to the idea that Americans are stupid. There's one in Australia called Dumb Americans. In Europe, there's a similar program. And what it, essentially what they do is they send a reporter over to the US and they ask normal looking people on the street uh, questions like, do you think the Eiffel Tower is in Australia? The answer, yes. You know, we, have a sh we used to have a show, are you smarter than a fifth grader? People couldn't say what country Mexico City was in or how many sides a triangle has. Half of Americans don't know what the Taliban is. Half of Americans don't know what the Taliban is, although we fought the longest war in American history, largely to combat them. And here's one that particularly disturbed me. American high school seniors, about 12,000, are asked on a test. It's a multiple choice question. They got four, four choices. Uh, which US Supreme Court decision is this quote from? We hold that in the field of public education, separate but equal is inherently unequal. Okay, they had four choices. So if a monkey was taking this test, 25% likelihood the monkey would get the right answer, right? American kids, only 2% got the right answer, and it was Brown versus Board of Education. By the way, and if you didn't know the answer, you might have thought that the question that had to do with education would go with the Supreme Court decision that's called Brown versus Board of Education. <laughs> But maybe that's too much to ask. So, you know, I could go on, and I do go on in the book for a number of pages, about why this is so important that we know our history, that we know what I believe to be one of the most important Supreme Court decisions in our history, that we understand where we came from in terms of race, race segregation. But in the interest of time, because I only have a couple minutes here to summarize, you know, a, a two or three hundred page book, let me talk about how this is harming us. So, I talk in the book about three different areas where this has really harmed us, this rise in ignorance, where we know so much about, for example, Lindsay Lohan, and we don't know about wars that we are in. Um, one of the areas is climate change. As scientific certainty has gotten clearer and clearer and clearer over the years, our interest in the subject has gotten less and less and less. And right now, Americans rank climate change 19 out of 20 on the issue of, legis on, of legislative priorities. In other words, we really don't care. And Americans, many Americans think there are two real issues, uh, two real sides on the issue, when in fact there aren't. But let me talk about you individually. So what is this doing to women? What is this obsession that we have with reality shows and the beauty industry and tabloid media really doing to us? When I spoke to women, when I speak to women, many say, Lisa, I'm with you. You know, I want to I read real books. I want to be up on the news. I want to be more connected with my community. But I'm just so darn tired. I have school. I have work. I have family. And so one of the most important things I can tell you is that it's so critical that you prioritize your time. How do you do that? Well, one of the things I talk about in the book is that you need to stop doing housework. What? What? I'm talking about housework in the same sentence as climate change? Yes, I am. <laughs> because American women are still doing one hour more of housework per day over their male counterparts when both work full time. So why is this happening? Why? I assume it's because we all see our mothers, we saw our mothers doing that, and we just sort of think this is the way of the world. But you know, our mothers had it a lot harder than we do. Right? We have a lot more opportunities. And so we really have to stop. Housework is not our job. It is not your job. It is not the job of anyone in this audience. It's not the job of the family member with the vagina. We have to stop doing housework. I mean it. So I, please, I, I, I'm quite serious about this. OK, so how do you do that? I talk in the book about this is a job you farm out. Uh, it's very doable. You know, young guys, they graduate from college. They get their first job making $25,000 a year. They get their internet turned on. They get their cable turned on. They hire a housekeeper. And you should do the same thing. And if you really can't afford it, you really, really can't, it gets divided up among everybody in the family. You stop doing housework, and you're going to create an hour a day for yourself or some amount of time for yourself. And what are you going to do with that time? You're going to read real books. And I'm almost out of time, but I want to just hit this point. It is so important to read books. It is so important to get offline and turn off the TV and read books. Why? Two big advantages. It creates new neural pathways in your brain. 
meaning it actually makes you smarter. Reading books actually makes you smarter. And you can choose the books you like, which I encourage you to do, but you should also choose books that are different. I call it cross-reading, different genres, different topics than you're used to because that makes you even smarter. And you get the advantage of a new knowledge base. I also want you to read a real newspaper every day, news site like the New York Times, which I highly recommend, and your local paper. That's gonna give you a huge knowledge base. And then the last part is I want you to connect. I want you to engage, and that also requires you to get offline. Because I know, and the studies support this, that people who are readers are more connected with their communities. You even exercise more, go figure. Because once you read, especially real news about your community, you're gonna find out that your library is closing and you're gonna to wanna to do something about that. You're gonna find out that your battered women's shelter is closing and you're gonna to wanna to do something about that. You're gonna to wanna to take action on climate change. I'm not here to tell you how to think or what to do when you engage. I have some examples in the book of things that are important to me, issues that I engage on, namely third world women and girls in particular. But that's not important. What's important is that you do connect, that you do engage, that you prioritize your mind, and you turn off all of these silly distractions that our culture is feeding you. And with that, I'm gonna stop and we're gonna do uh, some questions. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Ladies and a few good men, it is so wonderful <laughs> to be here. Lisa, like thank that. you for laying this out for us and painting a picture that is actually pretty depressing, to say the least. Uh, but there is a little hope. You outlined a little bit uh, towards the end of your comments about how mm -hmm. we get out of this. I also want to ask you, how did we get here? <laughs> is right. it because women feel so overwhelmed that we're sort of buying into the busyness obsession and we just want to check out. Right. This hunger for escapism, can you yeah. give us any insights as to how we got here? Yes, so how did we get here? Well, you know, I started talking about the media and that's because I work, part of what I do is in the media and so it became so obvious to me. Uh, you know, real news sites are dead and dying in case you didn't know. In fact, there's a whole website devoted to this called newspaperdeathwatch.org, and it lists newspapers that are dying. And at the same time, we've seen this meteoric rise in tabloid media like TMZ, Radar Online, et cetera, which not only are there huge entities in their own right, but they feed uh, mainstream media like CNN, et cetera, right? So we have this huge rise. And so I think for many young women in particular, you've never known a world where celebrity news didn't dominate the news. Those of us who are a little older, I'm 52 years old, I do remember a time when it was actually embarrassing to read Us Magazine or people, you know, my mother one time was in the National Enquirer for one of her cases and she said, Lisa, will you go and buy the National Enquirer so I can see it? And I said, I'm not gonna go buy that. I'm not gonna do your dirty work, you know, go buy it yourself. <laughs> it was considered embarrassing to read this stuff. You know, now I walk down the aisle of a plane frequently, and I look at what women are reading and about half are reading tabloid media. And not just reading it, but pouring over it like there's gonna be a test, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, I'm not here to say you can never have fun and read something silly, but I am talking about a life of balance because when I talk to college students in particular, you know, I ask questions about, the Kardashians, and they can give me chapter and verse in detail. And I ask questions about, tell me an issue before Congress, and it, crickets, right? Tell me where we are currently at war. I did this two years ago. We were in active combat operations in three countries. Uh, the most common answer was, I don't know. And nobody could name all three. So that seems to me that the media is a big part of it. I also talk in the book about education. Most Americans are unaware that we go to school far less than our counterparts in Western Europe and East Asia. So we have the shortest school days in the developed world, about six and a half hours. We have the shortest school year in the developed world. And by the end of 12th grade, Americans go to school an average of one year less than our counterparts. So of course we don't, we're not as competitive. Of course we're very low on international rankings. And that's a big part of the problem. You talk at the very beginning of Think, I'm going to quote you for a second, we all crave lives of meaning and substance, not the emptiness our culture is feeding us. Right. It's never too late to bring our brains back into the game. <laughs> I love that. So, um, and I say this sort of couching it, we're not trying to be self-righteous about this, right? We're not trying to be super judgmental of, of friends and family around us who do completely indulge in, in all of this media, but we are, I think, in this process trying to set an example mm -hmm. um, and, and step up in our communities and step up in our families and step up amongst our friends. I'm 
I must admit, as I talk to college students, I'm getting a little tired of hearing stories about women who slept with someone the night before and were thrilled because he remembered their name in the morning. Mm. And so I feel like right. this, all of this is, is, is polluting our souls and our brains as we exceed in this one area and we get more stupid in the so other. So here's the good news, though. 75% of us would rather win that Nobel than America's next top model. Okay, that's the flip side of the statistic that I began with. And as I speak about this, nobody ever says to me, you know what, Lisa, I want to know more about Justin Bieber, right? Nobody ever says that. Instead, they say, okay, yes, you're right. Now I see that I'm being inundated with all of this nonsense. What can I do to stop it? And, you know, I'm so thrilled that we're doing so well in school, that we are so smart. The question is, how do we take that and run with it in the next phase of our lives? How do we push back? Everybody wants us, right? Everybody wants a piece of us. Can you come to my event? Can you speak at this thing? Can you do the laundry? Can you take on one more project at work? And we really have to set boundaries and decide what's important to ourselves. So a lot of people ask me, how do I have a law firm, write books, and do television just about every day? How do I do all of these things? And a big answer is time management. Management. You already know that I don't do housework. <laughs> but I also say no to a lot of things, and I'm very clear about time. Or if I say yes, I say, okay, I'll give you an hour. Um, why? Because I have things I want to do. I want to write my next book. I want to take my next case. And so I'm very clear that my time is important. And it's so critical for you to understand that. What can you cut out of your life? A lot of it is things like wasting time online. And I'm very active on Twitter and Facebook. I love social media, but I force myself to stop, too. I'll go on for a while, okay, stop, put it away, walk away. Um, what can you do to create more time so that every day you can take one step closer to your dream? It might be a small step, but take a step every day. And you can't do that if you're so time frazzled and you don't have the time. Your, your time is valuable, it's important. That's probably one of the most important things that I can tell you. I wish I could just, get that you know, into everybody's head here. Your time is so important. I think men are much better about that than women are. We tend to want to take care of everybody. We have a hard time prioritizing ourselves. And we, we can't take on these really meaningful things in our lives if we don't know who we are. <laughs> Having said that, sometimes taking the meaningful action informs who we are. Mm, There's an so example good. that I'm obsessed with in your book because it happens to be my favorite documentary of all time. It's a film called Pray the Devil Back to Hell and it's about a community of women in Liberia who basically take back their country right. through civil disobedience and using every methodology that they have. And I imagine, not in any way to, to paint that action as a self-actualization process, but in the process of doing that, they absolutely found out who they were. Yes. We've got some really meaningful conversations happening right now around the Nigerian girls, Bring Back Our Girls, the Yes All Women conversation that many of us have participated in, um, the Solidarity is for White Women conversation. There's, some, there's like a tipping point and a zeitgeist moment for women speaking about the things that matter to us the most. And I'd here, love here. you to just close <laughs> us out in the last few minutes yes. that we have with your thoughts on these movements, on how we can find our own piece of these conversations and the conversations that we want to dive into. And, and give us your thoughts on how you're doing So that. I love everything that you just said. I love the movie Pray the, Pray the Devil Back to Hell, if you haven't seen that. It's a fantastic movie. Uh, there's also one called A Walk to Beautiful, which is about the Fistula Foundation, something that Chrisula and I both uh, are very involved in and very, very much support. I just came back from Ethiopia and visited a Fistula hospital, so I encourage you to take a look at that. But the bigger issue about finding our voices, and one of the things I love that you just said was it's not just about finding your voice, it's about creating your voice, right? We may not know who we are. That's why reading is so important, because reading is going to spark you. It's going to make you smarter. Um, and you're going to discover who you are. But it's so, most of, how many people here are on either Facebook, Twitter, or both? All right, so just about everybody. So everybody here has a voice that you can use today to speak out for what's important to you. Many people say to me, Lisa, here's a story I think you should cover. Here's something I'd like you to talk about. And I say, why don't you talk about it? Right? Why don't you get in? I mean, maybe I will too. I'm not saying I won't. But I want to see you using your voice. I just heard Gloria Steinem speak at her 80th birthday party. She's so fabulous. And somebody in the audience said, Gloria, I told somebody I was coming. It was a group of young women. And they didn't know who you are. Wow. And I was so upset. And Gloria, typical Gloria, said, it's not that important that they know who I am. It's important that they know who they are. 
So I leave you with that. I hope that you know who you are. I hope you live, live lives of substance and meaning. In the culture that we live in right now, it's not easy because you're being bombarded, but you can push back. A lot of people are pushing back. You know, I've been so inspired. My book isn't all gloom and doom. The first half is the problem. The second half of the sol is the solutions. And the second half is much more upbeat. And I've, I've heard from women all over the world who said, you know, I, I canceled my tabloid subscriptions and I started a reading group with my friends. And with the money we save from not going to a restaurant, we're donating it to a third world girls organization. I mean, there are so many examples of things that we can do if we just decide that that's the focus that we're going to have for our lives. I want to sneak one more thing in in that yeah. last couple of minutes. As we have these conversations on our platforms, whether it's Twitter, Facebook, or in our living rooms or at the grocery store, we also need to be unafraid of being wrong and learning new information. And I think that maybe that's one of the things that holds us back from articulating our opinions is we then, oh, it's going to cause an argument, my Facebook page is going to blow up. And See, I enjoy that. <laughs> I love it too, I have to confess. <laughs> so. But I also want to make sure that I'm keeping an open mind that when I do put something out there that I feel really strongly about, that I'm willing to listen to, to what some of my friends have to say uh -huh. and engage in conversation and be willing to change my mind. And I think, you know, I used to have a sign on my desk that said, you can disagree without being disagreeable. So we can disagree with each other, but let's not attack each other, especially online. And I can tell you as somebody who gets a lot of feedback on my Facebook and Twitter pages, the people who I listen to are the people who are respectful. If someone is just, blasting me, you know, using profanity or being really obnoxious, I, you know, I just think, oh, it's a hater and I just ignore it. But somebody who starts out with, and I, and I don't care, by the way, and you shouldn't care either. Um, but if somebody starts out with, you know, Lisa, I, I respect you, I heard what you had to say, but here's, I, I have a different perspective, or have you ever considered this? Or better yet, they send me a link to something that's got new information. Okay, now you've got my attention. And so I think it's certainly an art form to learn how to disagree without being disagreeable, but we can do it. But I think even more important for women is confidence. So there was a study that women have to be 80% sure of something before we say it. Men only have to be 20% sure. And when I told my fiance that, he said, I don't even have to be 20% sure. <laughs> <laughs> right? So I, I think that's true. And we should fact check and know what we're talking about before we talk. But I would also love to infuse everybody here with just a little bit more confidence. Uh, I was at an event recently where a man and a woman who were equals uh, were speaking. He stood up and spoke and commanded the room. She, when it was her turn, she said, do you mind if I just stay seated? And everybody said, oh yeah, okay, okay. I think it's partly because she was wearing these huge heels that were probably uncomfortable. And so she stayed seated, she was very bright, but I wanted to say, stand up, command the room, use your voice. Um, this is a clear gender difference. Sheryl Sandberg talks about this in her book, Lean In, that if you go to a conference room table, the women will all sit in the back, the men will, will sit at the head of the table, the men will speak more. So we've got to be conscious of that. We are so smart. We are doing so well. We have the skills. The next step is, if you don't feel confident, just fake it. Because guess what? That's what a lot of the guys are doing anyway. Exactly right. Thank you <laughs> right? so much. Thank you. Um,